So in our Managing Animals in Disasters project, um, that really sprung from, from evidence that people were taking risks um, to protect animals uh, over and above their own you know, safety in emergency situations. Um, and also that emergency responders were um, encountering people who, who, you know, they wanted the people to leave their homes um, to get out of danger, but they were refusing to go. So it was, it was causing some issues for uh, emergency responders as well in these situations um, around public safety. So it was a public safety component that was the driver for the research um, and the animal welfare element was, was a sort of um, important in this process as well, but it wasn't the main sort of driver of the research. So I think some of the complexities around um, animal emergency management for the emergency services are that um, you know, emergency services are looking after human life. You know, that's, that's the, primary, um, um, the, the primary reason behind what they're doing is to protect human life. Um, but people often won't leave without their animals. And the issue there is that you know, people have close bonds with their animals. Um, we know from the statistics in Australia that around 62% of households have pets and the majority of people who have pets um, consider them parts of the family, you know, members of the family. So you know, we wouldn't ask people to leave their homes without their children. Um, and to people who have pets, it's not that dissimilar an idea to, to, to ask them to leave the home without the pets. Um, and often because there is you know, varying degrees of preparedness around um, disasters, uh, across floods and fires and other sorts of disasters. Um, firstly, people p are often not prepared for themselves anyway, but even those who have prepared perhaps haven't considered their pets or haven't considered the extent to which um, considering their pets is going to impact on their behaviour and the times they need to, to evacuate and the things they might need to take with them. So the research project overall um, was really looking at a combination of what literature is out there. So what we found is a lot of, a lot of anecdotal information um, that was informative and, and indicated you know, great examples, but really didn't get us very far in terms of the extent to which this was, this was a problem. Um, there was fairly general acceptance that, that animals needed to be considered um, you know, it, it, more than they had been to this point. Um, but we really needed to sort of, I guess, set up a, a, a knowledge base um, in Australia. A lot of the research that had been done in this area was from the United States, from things like Hurricane Katrina, where there was a large sort of um, impact on animals and indeed legislation that changed the approach to animals in emergencies there. But we didn't have anything similar here. So we were looking at, um, you know, I guess the extent to which this was an issue, the sorts of behaviours that people um, might undertake, the ways in which they could be influenced um, and also um, what we could do to improve the outcomes for, for people in, in these situations um, in terms of the resources we could provide, what is best practice in this area already that we know of um, and how can we share that better. So as part of the Managing Animals in Disasters project um, I've done quite a lot of work with community in the Blue Mountains area of New South Wales which is a very fire prone area. Um, and in doing that work, we were able to sort of survey uh, residents around their behaviours during some of the major fires they've had um, with animals. And we found that, um, that, that, that in that situation, because it's a fire, high fire risk area, a lot of people had thought about fire and were generally fairly prepared, but not so much for their animals. And in particular, we found that people with um, horses um, not so many in the Blue Mountains, but elsewhere we certainly found horses uh, were particularly an issue. Um, but also people with chickens. So we'd find that people wouldn't leave without the chickens. Um, in terms of uh, examples of what people do, who do or have been known to do uh, in disasters um, with animals, uh, we've had incidents of um, people going into fires with horse floats to try and get the horses out you know, with children in the horse float with them, you know, in the car to go into the fire to get the horse out. Um, so people going into danger to try and get their animals out. Um, and we did have examples um, in Esperance in WA of um, people dying in a fire who were trying to get the horse loaded into a, a float and get the horse out as well. So, um, and we also had an example in Dungog. There was a lady who, uh, who wouldn't leave without a dog who died in, the, in the, those floods. So we do have some very um, well-known, well-documented examples, but what we don't know is, is 
you know, how many near misses there are, if you like, you know, that's obviously the tip of the iceberg. But we know people do a lot of dangerous things to get back to animals if they can't, can't get to them. Um, if there are b bushfire warnings, um, for example, that are issued um, for people to leave an area, what we often find is that, that one of the first things people do is they, they hear the warning and then they come back home. Um, and often they're coming back home for a range of reasons, but often animals are a part of that. So that could be to, to get the dogs, to get the horses out. And the other thing we find with horses is that, um, you know, they take a while to move. So, you know, if you start putting a time frame on evacuation in floods or bushfires, um, having animals can be a risk factor um, for not evacuating or for evacuating late. So one of the things that has been a great outcome from the project is a, a community work in the Blue Mountains where we've been using people's bond with their animals as a mechanism, if you like, to engage more in emergency preparedness. So, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to, to cut through, you know, why should I prepare for something uh, that may or may not happen? Um, I'm okay, that sort of thing. Um, but to turn that on its head a bit and say, well, how about your dog? Have you thought about where you would take your dog or your horse? Um, so it just gives us a bit of an in. You know, if you start talking to an animal owner about their animals, um, I'm as bad as everybody else. Um, I can talk for hours about my animals um, and it's a great way to engage with people. But um, yeah, if you can then have that conversation and bring that around to, you know, whether it's a flood preparedness, whether it's um, bushfire preparedness, and start to, to bring that into the equation, you can start to think about how they can prepare for the whole household, which of course includes the animals as well. So if we start talking to various stakeholders here about what, they can, what we can help them with when it comes to um, engaging with their communities around preparing for disasters, um, specifically where animals are concerned, um, one of the things we found useful there was that um, if we asked people where they would go for information, we found they were saying the local vet um, or indeed their um, emergency services. So those were the two places that people were thinking they would go to for information. But actually the organisations tasked with communicating about this are primary industries and agricultural departments typically. So um, there's a, a bit of a mismatch there. So the one thing we can do and we can help with is getting that information to emergency services, so open days, to have that information available, to um, I guess highlight this with emergency services as well, you know, that that information is available is, is really useful. Um, we've had open days in the Hawkesbury area here um, where we've tried to attract uh, large animal owners in particular because the Hawkesbury is, is, is very flood prone uh, and there are a lot of horses on the floodplain. And uh, a lot of the modelling that's done is about human evacuation but we know that humans are going to want to take the animals with them. So we really need to get those horse owners to be engaged in risk, to think about what they're going to do for their situation, where they're going to go, what their triggers are going to be to leave, um, how long it's going to take so that they can um, calculate back, I guess, when they need to start taking some action. So I think when we start thinking about animal emergency management and what we can do in the future to improve the situation, um, certainly there's already some good um, activities that are going on in evacuation um, in terms of evacuation centres being set up um, for people to bring their animals with them when they when they arrive. Um, even if they can't take them inside, at least now there is, a, there is good um, coordination around um, getting people to leave to start with and taking their animals and then wondering, worrying about what to do with them once they get to an evacuation centre. So um, yeah, the, you know, having evacuation centres where people can bring their animals with them even if they need to move, move to somewhere else subsequently um, is a good thing. So, so people can now at least bring their animals with them to an evacuation centre. They can get out of danger um, you know, in the first instance and then take their animals somewhere um, is, is a really good starting point. And it's something that came up in the, uh, in the Royal Commission around Black Summer bushfires. So that, that's already starting. Um, also, I think you know, the cool, uh, communicating and involving communities is such a big part of, of uh, disaster mitigation in general. So I think you know, more community-led, more, more community engagement in this area is really helpful, getting communities to help themselves. So we've um, coined this idea of animal-ready communities. So in the Blue Mountains, we've had the Blue Ark animal-ready community. Um, it's about enabling and um, empowering communities to work together to connect uh, as much as anything else and, and consider what they want to do with their animals. So if, if that community is a, a horse a pony club or a horse group, whether it's a street, 
um, you know, having conversations with your neighbours, um, talking to other people who've got a, a, an interest, if you like, in this area um, is really helpful. So that if you can't get home, because that's something we find that in emergencies, is people can't always get home. And if, if, you, if your neighbours know what you want to do with your dog, if you can't get home, then you know that you don't have to worry about getting home to get the dog because the neighbours will, will grab, grab him and take him with them if they have to go. So there are lots of things going on in, at the community level, I think, in this area, which are really positive. Um, and also, I think, just generally, more coordination between the various stakeholders um, within different states, but also across, across states as well. So there's more, um, I guess, harmonisation and integration in this area is, is really useful too.